Guillaume, welcome to the podcast. So great to speak with you. Really honored to have you here. You're uh, an award-winning journalist. Um, you've written uh, a book. This is your first book, or this is my first book. Yes. First book. You're, you're, you've produced documentaries um, for for the leading French television uh, station in uh, or, or channel in, in in France, I believe. Um, yeah. But you you started out as a as a lawyer uh, training in law. So so how did you how did you go f uh, transition from law into uh, journalism? Sure, I finished my law studies in D.C. at Georgetown University, and I always wanted to become a journalist. I wanted to be a traveler. And uh, after my studies, it was absolutely clear that I would uh, change path and I would move towards being a reporter. I had the chance to do an internship at National Geographic in DC right after these uh, studies at in, in Washington DC, and uh, on and on I could progressively, uh, you know, uh, work on reporting stories around the world. I was funding my first reports on my own because nobody would send me, nobody would know me, and uh, as I started to get more uh, more experienced. First, the first uh, media, uh, press, print media in France started to send me everywhere I wanted, actually. And then I started to turn my print IDs into uh, TV IDs for French and European TV channels. And after 12, 13 years doing this job, I've been reporting in many countries, many continents, and with a strong interest in resources. I love to talk about resource because people might think that, you know, it's very... Uh, far away to talk about, uh, you know, a story at the other end of the world. Why are they uh, concerned by the story? But they are concerned because uh, when I talk about resources, I talk about the resources that they uh, use every day, that they uh, eat or that they, they consume every day in their mobile phones, in their, in their uh, uh, plates. Um, so suddenly people become interested because they realize that actually what you're talking about, people or a situation at the other end of the world, has an impact on the way you live and the way you live has an impact on them. And so you create a link, you make a link between uh, two places which are very far and so then you make them uh, feel uh, connected. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it seems like uh, that's really important, that that's a really important thing and mm -hmm. to, to know where things came from and it seems like we really just don't have enough information uh about where things came from or i guess the question would be do we do consumers care where things come from or is it just that they don't have the information do you have any sense hmm, of that i would say <laughs> I, I, I would say both i mean i would say this it's a twofold answer uh, you know we are in the age of globalization where uh, you know, a supply chain for any product is completely uh, uh, diversified. A single product may have been uh, manufactured in dozens of different places in the world, so it's very hard to, to trace back to where which components, uh, where it comes from, where each component comes from. And I think also people don't really care. I mean, what they care about, consumers, they care to, to buy a, a less expensive product. All they want to have is just more buying power, but they have lost the buying knowledge. So, do you do you see your role as a as a journalist to make people aware of those connections between the their purchases and where the starting materials came from? Very much. I think that's my role. My little role as as a journalist. I can humbly, you know, help making people better understand, uh, you know, uh, uh, that they live in a connected world and that whatever consumption act uh, they may have, it will have an impact somewhere. It will leave a trace somewhere. And we as journalists shouldn't shy away from a role as educators. We are educators, whether we want it or not. And I think I, I have to, 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 to help educate people with what I know from the field, because I report from the field. And I try to speak to people clever everyone's clever and we we need to speak to what's most clever in people's mind and that's what we try to do together now yeah so the 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 subject of your book uh is uh, the title of the book is raw metals war um, rare metals war rare rare, me <laughs> rare metals <laughs> war <laughs> sorry um 
and it's all about uh, it's really I think what brings it would bring it home to people is it's about the the things that that are in the thing in the devices that we carry around with us every day, sure. which is phones sure. and, and other electronics. Yeah. Um, and um, how did you get interested in in rare metals and um, and um, writing this I, book? Yeah, that started in 2009, was more than 10 years ago. I read an article about these rare strategic metals, strategic because they are strategic for economies. And I was completely fascinated by the story of these rare metals, which I had never heard about. Uh, we talk about about 30 metals. Uh, which are called rare because they are very uh, much more rare than base and abundant metals in the Earth's crust. In the Earth's crust, you've got like, you know, the base metals such as iron, copper, zinc. But you find in the mine metals which are 2,000, 3,000 times more rare. And this is what we call rare metals. They're not very rare because we find them everywhere on Earth. But in a mine, if you want to dig into a mine, you might find very few of these metals because they're concentration in the earth's crust is, is very low so we talk about uh, gallium indium antimony rare earths which is a specific class of, of uh, rare metals we talk about tungsten cobalt um, graphite which is a very important mineral and i discovered this f absolutely fascinating world of this uh, of rare metals and also all the ecological economic and geopolitical implications of uh, you know sourcing them and securing their access and i've never you know um, stopped uh, digging into the story uh, <laughs> ever since that's a that's a great uh, a line there um uh literally digging um yeah literally <laughs> so um so these metals are you know uh, pretty much everywhere right and they also show up in i mean in in our technology and they also show up in so-called green technologies like solar panels and and other devices like that as well you you find these rare metals everywhere in digital technologies uh, all your uh, daily life is actually uh, completely, uh, you know, dependent upon these uh, resources, which you have no idea about. Your phone, as you showed, as you as you explained, and also green technologies. Uh, not every green technology, because you can discuss, you know, any kind of green technology. But to make it s simple, there is no green energy transition without these rare metals, because they have such amazing chemical and physical properties. Yeah. that actually they are very much researched for these properties by the green tech industry, uh, especially electric vehicles. You need uh, a lot of rare metals, rare and non-rare, but rare metals for making the batteries and for making the engine of the electric vehicles. And suddenly I started to touch a paradox, which is, but how is it that you have to dig these resources in environmentally um, um, difficult conditions for making a product that at the end is marketed as being a green product and I started to touch a paradox here and this is where my investigation started I wanted to go on the field especially in China which is one of the biggest producers of these rare metals yeah. to see the difference between what we say about these green technologies and how um, environmentally impactful these technologies can be when you manufacture them including in the mining process yeah i mean that that really kind of sucks when you think about it right because here, here we have you know technologies like solar panels that that don't produce carbon emissions at least you know uh, in their day-to-day -day use and you think oh this would be great this would be an alternative we don't we don't we're not going to pollute doing this but then we have to to, to, to create them, we have to, we have to, you know, disturb the environment in such a terrible way by, by mining these metals. Um, it's, t it sucks, right? Like there's no, it feels like, it feels like there's no way to win this, um, that, sort of energy problem that we have, that we, we, ha we need way more energy and there's no clean way to get it. So what do you think about that's that? That's exactly, that's precisely my point. Uh, well, first to say, uh, Green um, solar panels uh, may feature uh, rare metals such as gallium and indium. Uh, rare um, solar panels are made of uh, silicium metal, which is not very rare, 
uh, but it's called a critical mineral, a critical metal by the UN, it's by, by the United States Geological Survey, because there might be supply shortages, because there are tensions between the supply and the demand. So in my definition of rare, I include silicium metal as being an industrially rare metal, not a geologically, but industrially rare metal. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, these, uh, these metals, all these metals are mined in, in terrible conditions. And my first reaction when I saw that was exactly yours. How is that that I had never heard about this? How yeah. is that that you replace? I mean, I want this green energy transition for sure, uh, you know, Eric. Yeah. I, I don't want to keep, uh, to stay, uh, you know, uh, dependent on oil and coal. We know the impact of, of these resources on climate change. So we need to change and we need to find new technologies. But every, every time there is human impact, there is a pollution. The thing with these green technologies is that the pollution is concentrated during the manufacturing process mm -hmm. and might also uh, happen during the recycling process, assuming that we can recycle these technologies. That is yeah. another issue. But these technologies don't pollute when you use it. When I use it, yeah. I may uh, see a solar panel produce energy. Same for wind turbine. I may, uh, you know, uh, move myself in an electric car, and it's not going to emit any CO2 emissions. So I'm going to say to myself, "That's wonderful. This is a zero emission car because that is true. It doesn't produce CO2 during the the, the using phase. Mm -hmm. But what we don't see is what is the pollution and the CO2 emissions being actually uh, uh, produced." during the manufacturing phase and the end of life phase. But, you know, these manufacturing processes don't happen in Europe and the United States. They yeah. happen somewhere in the world in mining countries, uh, developing countries, poor countries where nobody goes. And we don't see that pollution because yeah. we have relocated the pollution, which has become invisible. And we pretend to be clean, yeah. but in fact, we are not. Yeah. Well, I think I think a lot of people are aware of the electronic waste issue at least in the united states that's you know people are bringing their at least bringing their electronics to recycling facilities yeah. and not just throwing them into landfills uh but as you mentioned in the book even that has problems in reclaiming these rare earth metals from uh you know electronic devices Sure. Uh, let me tell you, Eric, and also for uh, the people um, listening mm -hmm. to us, uh, yeah. rare earths are necessary for phones and more specifically for the vibration of the phone. So when your phone mm -hmm. rings, it might vibrate. And it's because there is a magnet which is made of a rare earth whose name is neodymium. And this magnet made of neodymium uh, actually um, enables enables your, your phone to, to vibrate. So that, that has a very, you know, uh, everyday yeah. <laughs> impact on your everyday life. Uh, why well, do you well, need... Yeah. Sorry. And you mentioned wind, wind turbines, you mentioned yeah. electric cars. I mean, all of those use magnets, right? Uh, in um, some fashion. And, and uh, that, uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, the biggest wind turbines uh, use uh, rare earth magnets, up to one ton of uh, neodymium for uh, um, the magnet of the offshore wind turbine. And also, most of the electric cars today might not work if the engine was not made of a magnet of neodymium. And you need four, um, I mean, on average, four kg of neodymium yeah. for an electric car. Yeah. So, so are a lot of the, so there is the reason that we need these rare earth metals? Is it often because we need them because of their magnetic properties? It is exactly because okay. of their magnetic properties, and yeah. when the, and these magnetic properties enables actually the, uh, the, the the magnet to to move itself, and it creates movement, and that's how we move today. I mean, that's that is what tra green energy transition is all about. It's how to create new movements without having to put oil in the in the in the car, and we replace oil with these magnets, which create movement, and then we can move ourselves without emitting any CO two. Okay. And with, with uh, thinking about, you know, what I remember from physics class, to, to get magnets to move, we have to apply some kind of electric, electricity to them, correct? 
electric yeah, field um, to them. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's exactly the point. I try to explain that in the book. Uh, you need electricity that will enable the magnet to actually uh, move itself. Um, and then that will create the movement. That's right. So you need electricity uh, for, for this. And this is the reason why you need an electric uh, battery for the electric car. Uh -huh. uh, this is why uh, in a Tesla, for example, or any other electric car, the main component of the car, which is very heavy, by the way, it can, very, can be very heavy. Uh, the main component is the electric car, uh, is the electric battery, sorry. And this is where the electricity will be stored. And this electricity will be used for moving the engine, moving the magnet in the engine. Ah, uh, interesting. OK. Uh, oh. Sorry, th there is some, uh, there is a police car <laughs> but he's going to move. Okay, no okay. problem. No problem. It's that city life for you. Um, yeah, there's always yeah. always some kind of something going on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. I don't think that people, th when they think about their electronic devices, we don't think about magnets. That's not the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I think people think about computer chips and things like that, but. But I guess um, even that, those use magnets in some fashion, yeah? Sure. Um, you mentioned the, 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 the phones, and the phones use magnets, as you said. And just a precision, the green technology revolution cannot come without uh, digital technologies mm -hmm. because our electricity energy systems are getting extremely complex. Uh, you have more electricity input from a more a, a larger variety of, a variety of resources on the one hand and on the other hand of the electric grid you have a wider use of a more diverse type of, of, of goods so that can be electronics or that can be electric cars and whatever kind of things so if you want to to manage this complexity in the electric grid, you need digital technologies, you need algorithm mm -hmm. in order to actually make sure that the right amount of electricity is put into the electric grid for the exact right uh, amount of use and that there is no waste in the meantime. So digital technologies are necessary and your phone is necessary because tomorrow you will create your own electricity you will have a panel, a solar panels on the top of your roof. You will create your own electricity for your own house. Yeah. But actually, maybe you want to sell or to give this electricity that you produce for yourself to your neighbor. And yeah. you're going to share this electricity with your mobile phone. So you need rare metals for the green uh, technologies. And you need rare metals for the digital technologies that will actually uh, ameliorate that will make these green technologies bigger so this is a twofold revolution green plus digital which come hand to hand to make the world more at least that's what i what, that's what i heard that's what i've been told more sustainable but these <laughs> two technologies use these freaking polluting resources right so so it's kind of a it's kind of a two-pronged thing right because we on one hand we we need electricity well, so that electricity is not always coming from a sustainable place and then the the platform the the digital devices or solar panels or whatever those are also not coming from a sustainable source um so, so you need you you need that's a paradox but, eric uh, but, you but, need uh, yeah, yeah go ahead but my question is do, do yeah despite the fact that those are those are both um, kind of have a net negative effect do do we still come out ahead in terms of versus you know just burning coal or burning gas or other fossil fuels yeah. do, do is the carbon trade-off there actually still better I think the carbon trade-off is still better but not as good as what you, mm -hmm. what you might think. Uh, the carbon trader might be better because if you compare the, if you make a full cycle analysis uh, f of uh, an, an oil car, for example, comparing to an electric car. So if you compare how much an electric car will pollute comparing to uh, the, the oil car during all its life, uh, you might say at the end of the process, uh, that's maybe better to to move with an electric car. Uh, so that, that is a very precise example of, uh, you know, showing that an electric car after hundreds of thousands of kilometers or, or miles will actually emit less CO2 during its, its life. The thing is, uh, we need to figure out where the electricity comes from 
uh, at the recharge uh, of the electric car. Yeah. Because if, you know, we are in the United States, in areas or states of the United States where there is a uh, nuclear electricity well the electricity which is produced is a very low carbon electricity but if we come uh, if we live in other places in, uh, in the united states or in the world where the electric mix is mostly made of coal well we will need to 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 burn coal to make electricity that will actually end up in the car so your car will actually move itself your electric car will move itself thanks to coal. And if you make a full cycle analysis of a car which just runs on coal, on electricity made of coal, well, if you compare with uh, with, a, with an oil car, at the end of the life of these cars, I'm not sure you see, this, you see the point. Especially in China, where the electric mix is mostly made of coal and oil. So you need to look locations by locations, countries by country. But you shouldn't forget one thing, Eric. Yeah. 40% of the world electric mix today is made of coal. Yeah. So it is the first source of electricity production. So the cars, the electric cars running today and which will run for the next 10 or 20 years will be mostly running on coal. And I'm not sure that's going to make, that's going to save our planet. I'm not sure these green technologies we call an electric car yeah. will help save the planet. Yeah. Do you think though that at some point, things both in terms of energy use and also harvesting the, the these minerals will become more efficient to the point that maybe the, the trade-off is better uh, mm -hmm. using green technologies and digital technologies versus you know traditional uh, methods is that possible sure. in the future it is very possible, Eric, and yeah. I think it's already going on, and we have to believe in science. Uh, yeah. my, 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 my speech is twofold. We shouldn't believe only in science. We shouldn't believe that technology will be the only solution that will save us and that will save the planet. I don't believe in this. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, science enables us to make a lot of progresses. And when you look at the progresses in terms of mining, uh, mining techniques, refining techniques of these metals, also in terms of recycling of these metals uh, after you know uh, after the the end of life of a car or any other green technology well you see that we are doing progresses that you know make people and myself a bit hopeful it will progress and that will certainly make these green technologies less polluting tomorrow than what it does today the question eric is when in the when is the future the future when is this what date because people keep telling me, why do you talk to me about these technologies today? Because the technological progresses will be such that in 20 years, in 30 years, and in the future, uh, this problem won't exist. And I reply to, to these people, when do you date precisely this moment? And nobody knows. Nobody has a single idea. Is this in 2030, 2040? This is very difficult to know when actually these green technologies, which, will, which will, be, will be much better than what they are today. So we are today in this present situation where uh, we have to face a dire reality. Um, uh, storing electricity in electric batteries is, ex is extremely difficult. We need uh, rare metals for 25% of wind turbines in the world. And we need, uh, and, we, and, 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 it, and it pollutes because most of these metals are coming from China, where the environmental regulations are not as they are in, as, as in the West. And this is what things, how things happen right now, today, as I speak to you, and we must face this reality as it is today. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's, that's almost a philo philosophical debate, because mm -hmm. there's definitely a group uh, that places a lot of faith in technology to sort of get us out of problems that technology has created <laughs> and, and it creates new problems <laughs> and it creates new problems <laughs> so but that's I, I feel like it's almost almost a philosophical position uh or something um but uh you know yeah. and then and then the, the flip side of it is well we need to you know be more realistic about what's happening now and we need to you know reduce our resource use and you know reduce reuse recycle kind of mentality i i think i'm probably somewhere in the middle i think we need to be doing both you know in terms of uh you know doing things to to curb our consumption and then also you know looking at technologies 
uh, in the you know, future. I think a lot of people see it that way. Um, but I'm not, I don't have complete faith that just technology is going to magically get us out of these sort of energy binds that we find ourselves in. Mm. Uh, I, I tend to be on the same page, um, Eric. I tend to, to believe the same thing. Um, uh, we we might we, we want to believe in technology. Technology uh, is getting so fast today that it completely changes the world around us. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, if we just believe that, uh, you know, by putting a solar panel on our rooftop and by, uh, you know, moving ourselves with an electric car, we're going to save the planet, we're wrong. That's my strong belief that we won't make it. And the, the solution is twofold. Yes, uh, for researchers. Yes, for funding more uh, new materials, researchers, new recycling methods, new uh, refining processes. And also, uh, let's not forget this word by Albert Einstein. We don't solve a problem with the mindset that has created this problem. So the question is, how do we change this mindset as well as, as we send the, change the technologies? And yeah. I think this is a twofold revolution, a revolution in technologies and also a revolution in our minds. And the second revolution is certainly the hardest one to, to achieve. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think so. I, I think also that the, the way that these green technologies are being sold um, you know, obviously when you're trying to sell something to someone, you're not going to tell them about all the bad environmental harm, uh, that occurred in the process of making it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, you the won't term, sell technology if you say anything like this. No. And the term, you know, so people that drive, you know, electric cars in the United States, they think, oh, I'm doing the right thing because that's how it's been sold to them, that they're yeah. driving an electric car and that this is the environmentally better solution um but but to me that comes you know it's a bit like the the term that's thrown around is greenwashing um it's it's first this is business and obviously yeah. you need uh, new technologies to uh, relaunch a business uh, a new world uh, with new technological application is replacing the former world and this is how business goes and it creates green jobs and it creates uh, economic growth and it creates it creates tax uh, tax payments for the state uh, so obviously uh, we need to believe in this narrative in this green narrative yeah and as you said eric this is pure <laughs> greenwashing this is a complete greenwashing yeah uh, you know when we end up relocating outsourcing all the pollution issues relating to mining of graphite, rare earths, lithium, cobalt, gallium, whatever, at the other end of the world, in Africa, Bolivia, China, but, and pretending at the same time to be clean. Sorry to say this, and that's a provocative um, phrase, but this green energy transition is the biggest greenwashing operation I've ever seen and ever heard of in the history yeah. because we got the world divided between those who get dirty the Chinese, mm. the Congolese, the Bolivians and on the other hand those who pretend to be clean and we all pretend to be clean and this is just that makes the green energy transition a just a huge greenwashing operation today yeah yeah I mean we all we all love getting those uh, you know new electronics in the in the sealed box and it's all clean and pretty and you know uh, we don't we don't want to think about where where those pieces of it came from um, but yeah. let me let me one thing that we haven't really talked about um, which you outline a lot in your book is um, and I think for the audience maybe isn't aware because we haven't really discussed is you know what what are the impacts of this mining uh, rare earth mining um, you talked about uh, uh, area in China where plants won't even grow in the soil. Um, you know, maybe you could just kind of walk us through like one of those areas and, and what you saw when you went there. Um, you cover the, you go into detail into this in the book. And if people want to really dive into it, they should definitely read the book. But maybe you could just give us a little, sure, little yeah. taste of, of, of what it's yeah. like to be in a, in a mining town where they, where they mine rare earth metals. Yeah, I've been in China uh, four times during the past 10 years. And most of this, uh, in three times out of four, I went to the mining areas. And the most recent trip I've made was last year. 
So what, you, what we found in the book is also an update of what I saw last year, more precisely in uh, the area of Bauto, which is a city in Inner Mongolia, 800 kilometers, uh, 600 miles away from on the northwest of, of Beijing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, the place where 75% of the rare earths are being uh, extracted from the ground and also refined. And the refining process of these rare earths is absolutely devastating because you need a lot of water to produce, to refine the rare earths. And the water, which is uh, you know full of heavy metals and chemicals after the refining process, this water is not treated it's just rejected directly oh. into the nature in artificial lakes where I've been. Uh, and people live around this place, people in villages and people who have who had to move from their village and who had to be relocated to uh, new cities very close to the lake. These people are agricultures uh, and they talk about their plants, which couldn't grow anymore and they lost their jobs because they cannot grow anything. They talk about cancers. They talk about radioactivity because uh, yet there is radioactivity associated with uh, rare earth mining and, and refining. And um, this is what I saw on the field. This is what I discussed with. I tried several times to escape the Chinese police, which was not very keen to have me reporting on the field. And uh, I remember discussing with a lady uh, last year who told me her name is, was Gao Xia. And she told me, uh, yeah, I mean, these uh, rare earths end up being uh, uh, included and featured into beautiful green electronics that will make people in the West so happy. But the ones who actually support and bear the pollutions this is me and this is my husband who lost their job and who are living in this polluted area. And this situation that I'm explaining to you, I've seen it in other places in China, notably in, in, um, in Elyongjiang, in the province of, province of Elyongjiang, in the north of China, uh -huh. close to Russia, where you extract the graphite. And I can, I can go with more stories with graphite, too. Yeah. So um, these, uh, in China specifically, it tends to be kind of in the interior of the country, correct, where this is happening? Um, oh yes, this is uh, in the in the rural areas, uh, far from the central power, mm -hmm. uh, far from the media attention, mm -hmm. where few people go, and where the industry has hands free to do whatever it wants, whatever is the regulations and whatever is uh, the you know the regulations. So we are in we are in gray zones, very much gray areas. So let me ask you a technical question because this is yeah. this is a science uh, show, anyways. Um, but why is so much water necessary to to remove these rare earth metals from from the surrounding rock? That is a very interesting question, yeah. and to be honest, Eric, that's the first time I'm being asked this question, <laughs> and I don't know. In the book, which I don't have in front of me, I quote a figure in terms of square meters of water being necessary for producing one ton of rare earths. I don't have this figure, I can check. Uh, but in terms of how much, why so much water? Uh, let me answer this way. Uh, a rare earth uh, is, um, you find very limited amounts of rare earths in a mine. Uh, in, a, in an iron mine, when you're going to extract one ton of iron, you will find a rare earth with them is neodymium mixed, naturally mixed in the earth's crust with iron. So if you want to separate the iron with the rare earth, uh, you will have to uh, go through a very, very uh, um, energy demanding and water demanding process. Why? Because there is more than 1000 less neodymium in this earth's crust, in this mine, than there is of iron. So if you extract one ton of, of uh, iron, you will find at the end one kg of neodymium. If you extract one kg of iron, you will find one gram of neodymium. Mm. So what you see is that if you want to extract one gram of neodymium out of one kg of iron, is going to you're going to need a lot of electricity, you're going to need a lot of water to repeat a process of separating them for dozens of times, and even some experts say hundreds of times, yeah. you repeat the same process and you end up with something which is pure, 99.9999% yeah. pure. Yeah. But this is going to take time, energy, and a lot of water associated with that. 
Maybe uh, I'll, I'll speculate because I'm a chemistry. Uh, I was, you know, a chemistry major in college. But my 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 mm-hmm. guess might be, in terms of the water use, is that um, they might have to put it into some kind of solution and then and yes, then catalyze there's... out the 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 metal or precipitate out the metal that they're trying to get from the other metal. Um, that, that if I was if I was approaching that as a chemist, that's probably how I would do it. Um, you may be right. Yeah. I haven't checked. Uh, okay. But yes, right. it, you, but the water is mixed at the end with all these chemicals that are associated in the refining process. Yeah. Okay. And then, so tying it back to the economic piece of mm-hmm. this, if if we were going to do that in the West, uh, because we have tighter environmental regulation i imagine that water would have to be treated in some way before it was just released into the environment which then probably increases the cost of harvesting these metals right is that is that kind of connect the dots there it's exactly right okay. uh, actually the united states used to be one of the first producers of rare earths in the world not that such a long time ago a couple of decades ago yeah uh, in california there was a mine uh, mine was named was uh, Mountain Pass and this mine was the biggest rare earth mine in the world but producing the rare earth was extremely polluting and uh, and water demanding and the environmental regulations at the time in California were getting so tight that the company Mori Corp had to invest more and more in its uh, refining uh, uh, manufacturing process. And that would make the cost so high comparing to the Chinese producing for nothing <laughs> at the other end of the world that actually the uh, Americans, uh, producers of these rare earths at some point said, let's stop it. We just cannot compete. And there were also, uh, you know, uh, complaints uh, with surrounding communities yeah. and impacts on um, ecological habitats. So it would make sense from a social, ecological, and from an economic viewpoint to keep the rare earth production in the United States. And the same happened in many other countries, Western countries in the world with other rare resources. We just uh, washed our hands and we said, hmm, the Chinese want to make the same work for half the price. They need to get richer because they need to catch, uh, catch up their delays and uh, t- their economic uh, delay to the West. Let's yeah. just let's make them do the shitty job. Sorry to, yeah. to speak that way. <laughs> and um, and we in the West don't want to have this. We don't really want to have these minds back for making the world greener. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's tough. Um. That is tough. And you know what I think? <laughs> and you know what I think? I think we would be courageous, we in the West, to look at this reality of the dark side of green technologies and say, if we want to make these green technologies less polluting than what they are, well, the solution is to relocate the mining process in our countries. Hmm. Because if these processes happen in Europe or in the United States with a better control from the administration, a better control from NGOs, a better control from the media, you don't. You, 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 I mean, at an industry, you cannot do anything you want. You're going to have to respect the rules, the environmental regulations. And at the end, your metal will be more clean and the green technology will be cleaner. Yeah. So that will make sense from an ecological viewpoint to say, let's relocate the mines in the West. But, yeah. you know, honestly, no one wants that. We all want clean technology revolution. We all want to have this greener world coming, but we don't want to bear the consequences. And I think there is a bit of hypocrisy here. Yeah. Sorry to say that way. And 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 consumers don't want to bear the cost, right? I mean, we we don't as consumers we don't want yeah. a cell phone that costs much more uh, because yeah. those were you know sustainably harvested metals. Yeah, you know? um, it's it's true. And and let me nuance that also, Eric, because yeah. um, obviously these metals, uh, if we had to produce it our, by our, on our own, it would cost much more. Uh, but in a phone in a mobile phone, an iPhone, which is like worth $500, $600. Most of the price of the phone is intellectual property. Mm-hmm. It is uh, the fact of, uh, you know, uh, 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 sorry, um, uh, uh, bringing it to one place to one another in the world. It is uh, the obviously the, the price that the commercial uh, expert needs to be paid for, for, for selling the phone. Uh, the price of the commodities in a phone is not that uh, important. It's going to be a couple of dollars 
in a six hundred dollar phone. Oh, okay. That's, that is, yeah, that is very strange and counterintuitive to say so. Most of the price is made by intellectual property, I guess. Uh, but still, because we don't want to 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 have these metals produced in our countries and to bear the cost of having them, the environmental costs, we prefer to have them uh, outsourced to the mine to to have the mines outsourced somewhere, and. At the very end of the of the of the story, I think that is more true with uh, electric cars, uh, wind turbines. The, the 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 price of the materials, which will make the price of the car different, uh, m- way different comparing to mobile phone. Mm-hmm. And we wouldn't be able, or we wouldn't want, we as consumers, to buy an electric car with U.S.-made minerals, uh, comparing to a car made with with Chinese. Chinese made minerals. The price will be different for a car, much more than for a phone. Uh huh. Just because you need so much more of those minerals to say, uh, for the batteries and such. And there is less intellectual property price in the car comparing to, to, um, ah, okay. to a, to, to a phone yeah. too. So, so the margins to use is this very tight for the car industry, for the car, but for the phone, it's like a huge margin, which is, which is exactly, why it's, yes. yeah. Okay. Exactly that makes sense. Yes. Wow, that's that's yeah, that's interesting. Well, um, yeah, I guess we need to put pressure on Apple and such to. Um. There is pressure on <laughs> Apple actually. There is pressure on Apple. Apple knows about it. They have lots of the NGOs, uh, uh, you know, uh, cl- you know, uh, claiming that Apple is responsible for environmental disasters for uh, because they sell so many phones. Uh, so these companies yeah. today uh, are required to outsource in a m- more responsible way their minerals. They must make sure that uh, there is no child labor in the cobalt mines in the Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and that this cobalt wouldn't end up in the battery of the, of the iPhones. So, the, 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 you know, you, we may be optimistic in a sense because uh, regulations and public pressure are already here, yeah. Yeah. and that forces these companies to change the way they, they make business. Yeah. That's going to take time. And once again, this uh, mining business is outsourced. It's... Uh, dirty but it's also especially murky it's not transparent you don't know who's the producer of the producer of the producer of the producer of the final (laughs) product so that's very hard to actually trace back uh you know all around the world the very first uh person who has extracted the mineral and so this uh, non or non-sufficiently transparent business makes it hard for ngos media to actually make sure that the company companies such as Apple and other companies have actually in reality the green practices yeah. they claim to have. Yeah, and as as we first started talking out, uh, I think that's a uh, that's a problem that afflicts a, a lot of these globalized commodities. Is we just don't know where they originated from and how they ended up in the products that we that we have. Exactly. Um, so so maybe that's a good place to end. Uh, We've been going for a while, but um, this has been such a interesting conversation. I think a lot of people will, will me too. benefit from it. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can read uh, Guillaume's book. Uh, I'll try to get it right. It's Rare Metals War. Yeah, it's the Rare okay. Metals War. The Rare Metals War. On um, Scribe. On Scribe. Um, and then is there, are there other places that people can find you online or is there a place that you'd prefer for them to to track you down sure uh, i have a website uh, my website is uh, guillaumepitron.com and um, you can find information on this website and also on my twitter account and linkedin account where i regularly post uh, uh, updates on the industry and also uh, recent interviews such as yours um, so yes, I'm easily accessible, and right. uh, you can find my email on my website. And if you want to write to me anything, uh, my email is public. So feel free to send me a note, and um, okay. I'll be happy to answer. Oh, that would be great. I'm sure I'm sure people would like to do that. Um, and I hope I'll be able to come to the United States anytime soon to, or for talking about the book. It's not possible <laughs> yet, but I'd love to to be able to come <laughs> and to maybe do a TEDx or something like this. But actually, to to um, to be to be more proactive on the U.S. side. I love the United States. Yeah, yeah, hopefully that day comes soon for sure. 
Um, Hopefully. <laughs> all right, Guillaume. Well, thanks so much. Um, again, thanks, great Eric. speaking with you, and uh, and we'll 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 just end here. Thanks.